All right, 1 Samuel chapter 30, beginning at verse number 1. And it came to pass that when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south in Ziklag and had smitten Ziklag, and they burned it with fire. And they had taken the women captive that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and then went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. And David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. You ever been there? Uh, we just feel like, okay, I don't even have anything else to cry about, man. I mean, I'm so, you're so hurt, you're so disappointed, so devastated by this news that you don't even have any more emotion to give to it. Verse 5, and David's two wives were taken captive, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess and Abigail, the wife of Nabal the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed because the people spake of stoning him. Because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. When I mean, you talk about disappointing circumstances, you talk about setbacks, David comes home to the camp. Now, the whole reason why he's away from the camp is a whole other story. He's away from the camp because he's out trying to pursue chasing Saul. He, he joins himself to the Philistines and is going to try and chase Saul down to kill him. And even though Saul was wrong, Saul was still God's anointed. That's the thing we got to understand. Even when somebody is wrong, if they are God's anointed, just let God deal with them. Well, he gets, goes away. And by the time he gets back, the Amalekites had invaded the camp, had taken his wives captive, had taken his children captive, and all the men that were with him, all of his soldiers, 600 men with him, all of their wives, too, have been taken captives. All of their children have been taken captive. Now, the, the, the story tells us they didn't kill any of them. Well, that's after the fact. It has been written afterwards. When David got home to Ziglag, they didn't know that nobody had been killed. There was no blood in the camp, but they didn't know if they took them elsewhere and slew them. They didn't know if they had been mistreated or molested in some way. So they're standing there, 600 men plus David, and they're in a panic situation. This is a major setback. Well, now, David's got a choice. He, he, he's got to choose how's he going to respond to this. He can respond letting the setback tell him what to do. Because I'm sure the setback, have you ever seen one of those movies where at the end of the movie you can go and watch the alternate endings? This, this movie here, this story of David could have had an alternate ending. Because David could have let that setback call him to do what Saul did later on, which is go and fall on his own sword. This thing is so bad. This is horrible. He could have fell on his own sword, or he could have let this situation make him get so angry that when not only has this happened to him, think about this. This happened to him and his men, and then all of his men turn on him. He's standing there 600 to 1. You talk about impossible odds. I don't know what you went through this week, but I doubt that it was 600 people all standing up against you at the same time. I doubt that you had 600 people saying, we're going home to get our guns. When we get back, we're going to kill you. Come on, stoning somebody was, in effect, no different than somebody saying, I'm going to kill you. 600 men, who after they get done weeping for their families, they all turn around and say, we're going to stone David because he's the leader. He's the one who had us away from this camp. So David could have fallen on his own sword. He could have decided, I'm going to take all of them on and let anger get the best of him and would have gotten stoned to death right there by the very men that were supposed to be there to help him. But instead, the Bible says David encouraged himself in the Lord. I mean, how many know in the middle of a setback, you got to learn how to encourage yourself? Come on, thank God for good friends. Thank God for having, you know, your, your accountability partners. Thank God for having other ministers around you. Thank God for being able to call the church 24 hours a day you can call us. But how many know there's some times when you're trying to reach somebody else and you can't reach them? And there are other times when you can reach them, but they don't even have the right word for you because they don't really understand what you're going through. So David encouraged himself in the Lord which means David had to look himself in his own spiritual mirror and build himself up. I believe this is when David wrote, why are you so downcast, oh, my soul? Put your trust in God. And sometimes you got to tell yourself, stop tripping. So if you don't watch it, you can get addicted to sympathy. If you don't watch it, I mean, the way that we, we're wired as human beings, we need encouragement. We need to be built up. We all need affirmation at times. But the last thing you want to do is get addicted to sympathy because you don't want somebody just patting you on the back saying, oh, poor baby, it's going to be all right. 
You know, the Lord knows all things. God's got you in this. He's taking you through this for a reason. Not in the middle of a setback, you don't want nobody telling you that. So sometimes if you don't have anybody around you that can preach the right kind of sermon to you, you're going to have to preach it to yourself. I said, sometimes you got to preach that sermon to yourself. <laughs> sometimes you got to tell yourself everything is not going to be all right. Everything is all right now. I said, everything is all right now. And that's the word of the Lord for somebody in here. Everything is all right right now. Despite what it looks like now, it may not turn out the way you hope for it to turn out. Because sometimes, even in our prayer times, we try to manipulate the outcome to be what we think it ought to be. And one of the greatest acts of submission to God is learning how to submit to the fact that sometimes his will is different than what we've been trying to manipulate it to be. Now, his will is not mysterious. If you take enough time, he'll tell you his will. But sometimes we can't hear him telling us his will because it doesn't fit the narrative of what we wanted it to be. Amen. I said amen. So David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Verse 7. And David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David. And David inquired at the Lord. Notice David went to seek God. He inquired at the Lord and said, shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered, pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them and without fail recover all. In other words, he said, you got a setback now, but it's getting ready to turn into a comeback, David. So David went, he and the 600 men that were with him, and they came to the brook Besor, where those that were left behind stayed. But David pursued, he and 400 men, for 200 stayed behind, which were so faint that they could not go over the brook. And they found an Egyptian in the field that, that they brought to David and gave him bread, and he did eat. And they made him drink water. Well, now notice what happens. David takes the time to see God. In the middle of your setback, you got to muster up the courage to see God. The most natural thing in the world to do in the middle of a setback is to want to react to it. I need to do something. There's a lot of folks in jail because they reacted in the middle of a setback. There are a lot of folks dead today because they just reacted to their setback. Instead of slowing down to do what David did, David took the time to seek the Lord. Well, now he seeks God and God tells him, yeah, go and pursue because you're going to recover everything. But I want you to notice he left with 600 men, but then they got to this brook, the brook Besor, and 200 of the men didn't have enough strength to go over the brook, so they had to stay behind. What does that tell us? There's some people who are with you in your setback that won't be around for your comeback. I'm preaching way better than you saying amen. See, it's easy to get a crowd in, in your setback time. Some are there because they genuinely care. Some are there because they just like to see a good train wreck or car accident. Some are there because they want something to post on Facebook or Twitter to be the first one to break the news. There's a lot of folks that will be around for your setback, but you can't take everybody with you to your comeback because some of them don't have the strength to go all the way and watch God do the miraculous, praise God. And if the truth be told, you don't even want all of them at your comeback. Huh? Amen. 200 of them say, we're too tired. We can't go all the way with you to get the stuff back. Hallelujah. Verse number 12, and they made the Egyptian a piece of cake. They gave him a piece of cake of figs, and they gave him two clusters of raisins. When he had eaten, his spirit came again to him, for he had, for he had eaten no bread, nor had he drunk any water for three days and three nights. David said unto him, To whom belongest thou, and whence art thou? He said, I'm a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite, and my master left me because three days ago I fell sick. We made an invasion upon the south of the Cherethites, which, and, and upon the coast which belongs to Judah, and upon the south of Caleb, and we burned Ziglag with fire. David said to him, Can you bring me down to this company? He said, Swear unto me by God that you will not kill me, nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will bring you down to this company. And when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread upon the earth, eating and drinking and dancing, because all the great spoil that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. And David smote them from the twilight evening until the evening of the next day. 24 hours kicking butt. That's the way it's going to be for you, man. The enemies that, <laughs> come on, the enemies that thought you were down for the count, 24 hours of butt kicking, praise God. He kicked their behinds from the evening of one day to the twilight of the evening of the next day. 
And there escaped not a man of them except 400 young men that rolled camels and fled. And David recovered everything the Amalekites had carried away and rescued his wives. And there was nothing lacking to them, nothing small or great, sons or daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all. Well, that's what I call a comeback. Come on, say, that's what I call a comeback. Um, when the enemy's got the audacity to strike you and set you back, come on, David comes home, his whole camp has been burned to the ground. It looks like it's about to be a terrible situation, but I told you, your attitude determines whether it's a setback or a failure. If David has a woe with me and give up attitude, then the end of this story is David's family and his, his, his children and all of his men's families get taken and all of his stuff gets taken away. But God only gives you that bit of news about what happened on the setback so he can tell you the end of what happened on the comeback. Yeah. Come on, you don't get to a comeback unless you had a setback. Yeah. I remember one time years ago, man, I had gotten some horrific news, and I'm sitting there trying to figure out why. You know, I'm living right, doing right. And one of my, my close friends, when I told him the news, he said, well, why not? Why, why shouldn't it be you? I wanted to reach through the phone and smack him. Pyre. What do you mean being spiritual? Why shouldn't it be me? And what he meant by it is if anybody was going to get hit with something like this, if anybody's going to get attacked, shouldn't it be somebody who's got enough faith that's not going to be moved by this thing? I'm not saying that God did. I mean, surely God didn't do it. But the enemy will come and try to attack. And if anybody's going to get hit, shouldn't it be one of you spirit-filled, strong believers that have enough word on the inside of you that's not going to melt away? Hmm. Well, David, not only did he get his stuff back, got his wives back, got his children back. And David demonstrated that when you have the right attitude in the middle of a test or trial, that test can be turned around and become a comeback for you. 